1 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll read from verse 12 to 27. And what this passage is about and what we'll be spending our time discussing this morning is the subject of togetherness and unity uh, as Christians. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being mem many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And... If the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. But God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism or schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether all members and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now Ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Let's ask the Lord to uh, bless us together as we study His Word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful, sunshiny day. Thank you for the measure of strength and health that you've given to each of us as we're gathered together in this one place this morning to spend a little time in fellowship and in study and in praise to you. And we pray as we do spend this time meditating and thinking on your word, that your spirit would open our minds and our hearts, that as James writes, we would not merely be hearers of the word of God, but that we might have a willingness within us to do, to put into practice, to live by the things we have heard. We pray that you would help us to understand the tremendous significance, the crucial importance of this uh, reality being put into practice, that we would, as your children, live together in unity, that we would function, that we would cooperate with one another, that we would be concerned and sensitive to one another's needs, to the ups and downs, to the um, successes and to the uh, wonderful things that happen in our lives, that we would rejoice with one another, and that we would also weep with one another when necessary. So we just commit this time to your hands and ask that you would open our hearts and minds in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said last Sunday morning, we're going to spend uh, the summer months, uh, I expect probably nine or ten sessions together, uh, whenever I speak anyways, uh, talking about uh, the subject of togetherness and Christian unity. Uh, I feel constrained to talk about a positive subject for some time since we have been talking about a negative sub subject for so long. And I feel that uh, <clears throat> this cannot uh, be at all uh, inappropriate. Uh, it can only do good, I think, to look at what the Word of God has to say about how we may help one another. In fact, that is the phrase that first got me started on this study on my own. Uh, one another is a phrase that occurs about 30 times in the New Testament and quite a few more times in the Old Testament. But with real practical instruction to Christians, this little phrase, one another, is, 
is quite familiar in the New Testament. It's, and it talks about just that one thing, the unity, the oneness that we who are God's children share with one another. It's, it's something that today in, in practice so often is like the elusive dream, as the song goes. Uh, unity is, uh, is usually spelled untied, or um, it's like the guy that said, well, he finally got it all together and he forgot where he put it. You know, uh, so many things uh, mitigate, work against Christians really uh, experiencing unity. Uh, there are movements today. There are many uh, grassroots movements and there are many very all-pervasive uh, international movements in religious groups today uh, that uh, work on the basic assumption that we ought to be unified, that we ought to work together, and uh, that there should be a oneness among all Christians. And uh, to a simple reader of the Bible, there is um, very little that you can say to, uh, to try to convince them that unity is not right. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is really, is it not, the um, underlying, the major dominant philosophy of religion that most people have today, that we all ought to be getting together, let's hold hands and work together, um, as the um, theme song of the ecumenical movement today says that uh, we are one in the Spirit, we will walk hand in hand, we will work with each other, and so forth. Uh, that, that is uh, what most people that are religious today really believe in. If there's anything that is common to us today, it's that we believe in unity, right? Everybody with me? I agree. And I have... Uh, uh, I, I think sometimes uh, we as Bible-believing Christians and, and believe, those of us who believe that we must practice all that the Word of God teaches, sometimes we can lose uh, perspective, sometimes... Uh, in our teaching, we can neglect this very important theme, and, uh, and that's why I want to spend some time discussing it. I believe in unity. I believe Jesus wants us to work at unity. And uh, even though we have problems, even though the Bible teaches uh, that we must divide under certain circumstances, there is such a thing as discipline. You must spank uh, the sinning members and so forth, which is what we've been talking about for so long. I want to counter that by looking at the other perspective. I want to look at some of these things where the Bible says we must be together. Let's work together at it. Just to fill you in on a bit of, the, of where we're going this morning, I just wanted to start with uh, looking at uh, <clears throat> togetherness in the wrong sense, the wrong kinds of togetherness. But in the days to come, we're going to really put an emphasis on the attitudes that develop togetherness and unity among Christians in the local church. We want to look at humbling ourselves to one another, submitting ourselves to one another. We want to look at loving one another. We want to look at caring one for another. We want to look at being kind to one another. These are all necessary, uh, crucial attitudes that it's so easy for us in our everyday schedules and um, hectic life and and, uh, and the real emphasis put on formality in so many things, an organization, that we kind of forget the spirit of the Christian life. And uh, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you can have the greatest of the gifts, and you can go to the greatest extent of dedication and service for God, and, um, and things like this, but if you don't have the right spirit, you don't have the right attitude, then you're wasting your time. You might as well not do it. To obey is better than sacrifice. God's Word says that we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And our attitudes as Christians is so fundamentally important. We're going to look at those attitudes that contribute to togetherness and unity in the local church. I also, also want to emphasize that because the Scriptures put a real, puts a real emphasis here, on actions that maintain and contribute to unity and togetherness. And the scriptures talk about uh, edifying one another and being hospitable to one another and ministering and serving uh, to one another and admonishing one another and comforting one another and confessing our sins to one another and praying for one another and fellowshipping with one another. And these are only a few, you see, one another. 
And, and this is where we're going in the next few weeks, Lord willing, if He gives us the time. I'd, I'd love uh, next Sunday morning to be all together in the presence of the Lord, as the song says, on the other side of the river, uh, one with another, uh, with all the other Christians that have ever been saved. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? And, uh, and in the presence of the Lord, being spiritually and physically united and, uh, and for eternity enjoying the benefits of, of making the decision to trust in Christ in the first place. So this morning we have read a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that describes Christians in their relationships one with another. This is the way it should be. This is the way it is spiritually. God knows that we are all united in spirit. God describes the relationship that we as Christians have with one another as just a big body. We are uh, spiritually in a relationship like you where you are sitting in your shoes and on your chair this morning are. Your physical body is an illustration of the spiritual kind of relationship that we enjoy together. This is what Paul develops. We can no more say to another Christian, I don't need you. This church can get along fine without you then you can any more say to your index finger in your right hand, you know, uh, it's ugly, it's bent, it's crooked, it's got scars on it, I think I'll get rid of it. We can't afford to do that. We need one another. And there are all kinds of things in the Scripture this morning that we're going to look at where the unity is destroyed or perverted and turned around for the wrong kind of thing. There's all kinds of the wrong kind of togetherness. I mentioned the ecumenical movement a few moments ago. And as Paul says, I hate being negative, but this is what we're talking about this morning is the negatives on the subject. And we're going to leave it and put a real positive emphasis later. But let's just look at the problem here for a moment. Unity for the sake of unity is something that scriptures forbids. I'm not talking out of both sides of my mouth this morning. The Bible says we are one body. All right. Unfortunately today, just by looking at another person, you can't really tell if they are a member of Christ's spiritual body. That You can't really tell if they have actually been baptized or placed into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit because of their trust in Christ. You can't tell by looking at a person's physical form. I can't tell the decision that you have or have not made. Only God and you know. And I hope to God this morning, that every one of you in this room this morning has seriously considered the claims of Christ and the promises of God's Word concerning your destiny and have put your faith and you are depending constantly on Jesus Christ for your salvation. Because if you have not, this doesn't apply to you. You might as well go. But just in case you want to learn a little more, I would advise you to stay because it's a wonderful thing to know about the unity of Christians and it's also a very important thing to be aware, to be forewarned of the false kinds of unity that uh, are all pervasive in the religious realm today. The ecumenical movement is, you can forget about the name because that's not important, but it stands for a philosophy that millions of Religious people around the world today who are Hindu, Buddhist, Catholic, Anglican, Baptist, Independent, Presbyterian, um, Indian, uh, doesn't matter what religion you are, you can be a member of the One World Religious Movement today, all under the umbrella organization of the World Council of Churches. And if you were a member this morning, if you were a member this morning of a mainline denomination church, like some of those I've already mentioned, and you give monies to the church or the organization, you didn't know it probably, but mainline organizations are members of the World Council of Churches and their monies automatically go to support these huge umbrella organizations that support terrorism in South Africa and communist subversion in Zaire and other places in the sake of freedom of religion. And the World Council of Churches Creed is believe what you want, basically. Okay? Oh, it's religious and it's spiritual. And the real emphasis is let's all hold hands and work together because we all serve the one God in heaven. You can call him Krishna if you want, or you can call him Jesus if you like, or you can call him Buddha. It makes no difference. 
And that's unity for the sake of unity today, and that's condemned in the Word of God. The Old Testament is full of admonitions that there is only one true God, the maker of heaven and earth, and his name is Jehovah of Israel, and Jesus is his name. And uh, Solomon in the Old Testament warned against uh, wrong relationships, wrong friendships, and activities that resulted from uh, getting together with the wrong kind of people. Now, I know that every one of you here this morning, because you're all past the teen years or just about to get out of them, that uh, you've all gone through the same experience I have had. And that is that you've had to cross over the friendship issue. The, the real problem of who's going to be my friend and what kind of people am I going to hang around with. And I mean, and this is something that we consistently develop through our lives, of course. We're all social beings and we work with one another and live with one another. And we all have dealings with other people, right? And we've all probably made at least one really bad mistake of making the wrong kind of friend. And Solomon warned. He said in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 10 to 19, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. They say, cast thy lot in, in with us. And let, and let us make haste to shed innocent blood. Uh, I can, could give you a few illustrations of not violent, but semi-criminal activities that I was involved in. And I was a preacher's kid because of the associations that I made on the sly, okay? And the encouragement that we had to do some things. And uh, I haven't in, in divulged that information in particular form to my parents because I didn't want them to know, all right? But we all have these little skeletons in the closet and perhaps in your own experience today you are still suffering from the wrong kind of relationships, the wrong kind of togetherness, that you have unified your heart and time and energies and spirit with somebody of the wrong kind. <clears throat> Proverbs was written to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the strange woman who has forsaken the guide of her youth, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and to keep the paths of the righteous. The word of God is here is to show us the way to go. The first psalm, contrast two very different groups of people, the righteous on the one hand and the wicked on the other, and says they're two groups. They, they work together. They hang around with one another, and on the judgment day, they're going to have two separate ends. It's a fact of life. We deal with it. We have dealt with it in the past. Perhaps we're still suffering with it, and still wrestling with these problems, maybe we're in the wrong kind of relationships today. We've got to be careful. Unity for the sake of unity is not a very good idea. Paul taught the same thing. He'd experienced persecution and opposition by people that were unified together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, Paul said, Be not deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals. And that's a verse that every kid starting school ought to learn. You know? The kind of friends you make, if they're bad, they're going to pull you down. You can't drag them up. It doesn't work the other way. And Scripture is full of examples of people that cooperated in evil. And uh, Scripture prophesied that this sort of thing would continue on into the last days in which we live. For instance, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul was referring to this already this morning. He said, The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, they as religious people. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. And he's describing cooperation. He's describing unity. He's describing togetherness. And see, and this is what people really, if you don't have a big group today, the idea is it's not worth belonging to. You got to be together and beware of big movements because the majority is usually wrong. Look at Noah's day. How many people were right and how many people were wrong? Eight righteous souls were saved by God 
And Jesus taught in Matthew chapter, I think it's 25, that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And he's talking about today. Because there's nothing to hinder Jesus Christ from appearing in the sky at this moment. So, as an introduction to this study of togetherness and Christian unity and, and, and uh, cooperation, I want to first look at some bad examples for a very definite reason. That is to remind us, to forewarn us, to sensitize us to the dangers of cooperation for the sake of cooperation. And the whole stress in this whole series is going to be on the word cooperation, on doing things together. Now, we can see some examples of this, and, and uh, <clears throat> this is not a very profound message at all this morning. We're going to look at some verses, we're going to read them, we're going to look at it and say, this is what it says, and we'll go on to the next one. You can, I, I just want to catalog this information, set it in your brain, uh, let you feed on it this week, just so that you can mull this over and, and, and be aware of a problem. The problem is, is that we, who are God's people, are just as much faced with the temptation of cooperating in error and being unified in the wrong things as unsaved people very definitely are doing today. And this is an issue that every one of us has got to deal with on a personal level. And uh, usually... It usually hangs on the one issue of who's your friend? Who's your associations? Now, let's look at a few exhortations this morning, prohibitions in the Bible, commands that the Bible says, contains, that were given to God's people at various points in time that obviously show us what we should not be doing one with another. And then I also want to look at some examples. So you can remember those two words, some exhortations and some examples. That's where we're going in the next 25 minutes. So in your Bibles, let's go all the way back to the Old Testament to Leviticus chapter 19. <clears throat> Leviticus, the third book in the Old Testament, chapter 19 and verse 11. <coughs> we're only going to read a very minimal number of verses out of the Bible this morning. Uh, that come under the category of commands or exhortations. The Jewish rabbis catalog them. I think the number is 613 or 614 commandments in the Old Testament, if you read through there. And one time, uh, just for interest's sake, I, I went through and I made a list of all the commandments in the New Testament. You know, there's just about as many commandments in the New Testament as there are in the Old Testament. We kind of lose sight of that sometimes. And uh, we kind of get the idea sometimes that now that we're Christians, we're delivered from the Ten Commandments, we don't have to live by the law, we don't have to worry about all these things that God used to say that God's people had to do. We can live like we please, as long as we're Christians. And that's a whole problem in itself. That's wrong, by the way. Right? But this command that we're reading in the 11th verse of the 19th chapter of Leviticus is only one of a bunch. But it's got that little word, one another, in it. Paul, uh, not Paul, Moses wrote, you shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. Now, if you can't understand that, uh, I'm going to be in a hard way trying to communicate anything with you this morning. The Word of God is pretty straight, isn't it? The Bible says, Thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not deal falsely with one another. In other words, in your relationships with other people, be honest. And you should not, and this is what we're looking at this morning, don't cooperate in uh, deceitfulness and hypocrisy and dishonesty and untruthfulness. It doesn't pay. And just in case you're still not convinced that we've got to live today by the Ten Commandments, you can read Colossians chapter 3, verse 9, where it says exactly the same thing, written to Christians. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 9, let me just read it. It says, Lie not one to another. See, there you have it again. In your relationships with people, don't be a liar. Don't cooperate in dishonesty and falsehood. You know, I've caught Christians doing it because I've double-checked what they said. And it's not a very nice thing to realize that fellow believers can leave half-truths, which are just as bad as 
whole untruths uh, and false impressions with other Christians and with unsaved people. That's even worse. How in the world is the, un the watching world ever going to desire what we have if we're wrecking it all by a life of dishonesty, cooperating, you know, <clears throat> leaving the impression with people that we are what we aren't, uh, actually going about shady dealing, uh, taking what is not ours. Now, this is not a message on hypocrisy and lying and deceitfulness, but it, you can, can you see that you can cooperate with the guys at work to be dishonest? You can cooperate with your wife to leave a very different impression with other Christians in the church than you show in the privacy of your own bedroom and around your own kids. You can cooperate with any number of people to do what is forbidden here. And God's Word forbids it. Let's read another one in Leviticus chapter 25. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 25, there's several verses in this chapter of interest. <coughs> Verse 14 reads, And if thou sell anything unto thy neighbor, or buy anything of thy neighbor's hand, ye shall not oppress one another. Now, uh, today, the Jewish people have a reputation, don't they? The Jew, you know, when you say, uh, you Jew, you Jewed me. Right? It's unfortunate that God's people have completely turned away from the law that was specifically originally directed to them. What happened here? <laughs> so, that clock ruined my whole message. <laughs> it's five after twelve. I didn't think that it was going that slow. Uh, we're going to have a rerun next Sunday morning, picking up from where we started off, because this, uh, this is horrible. Okay, it happens to everybody. Uh, ye shall not oppress one another. So we, uh, we can and we do um, oppress one another in our business dealings with one another. How many times have you we've been ripped off? I was just talking with Albert here last night. He came over for a visit. Uh, it was nice to see them. And uh, he said, uh, I've got to be careful who I buy this. Uh, we were talking about goats. You, can, you just can't buy a goat from anybody. You've got to buy from somebody that you know because somebody is going to rip you off. They're going to sell you some old dame that's 10 years old and has got no milk left and has, can't have kids. And, uh, you know, you've got to be careful. And people do oppress one another, don't they, in their business dealings. Verse 17, you shall not therefore oppress one another. Verse 46, uh, <clears throat> in the days in which Moses was writing, slavery was a, an all-pervasive practice in the Mideast, and, and he wrote on the subject, you shall take these people as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your slaves forever, but over your brethren, the children of Israel, ye shall not rule one over another with rigor. What he was saying, basically, is don't take advantage of your brother. Right? If you have dealings with one another, for goodness sakes, don't be ripping off your own family members. And I, it, for the life of me, I shake my head at some of the things that parents do to their kids. Now, I mean, it's their business, and I'm not going to intervene. Right? But it slays me how that some parents can... Uh, <clears throat> oppress their kids in business dealings and, and charge them outrageous amounts to live at home and, and, and do this and that. I've heard some stories I just don't believe, almost. Right? Um, anyways, the principle is, you know, you don't, you don't take advantage of somebody and rule over them with rigor. Don't make their life miserable. Now, we've only looked at two or three specific examples. As I said, the clock ripped me off this morning. Um, that talk about how we can cooperate together in, in error. And uh, perhaps we'll just kind of finish this message off in the introduction next week and, and get going with the, with the other stuff. Um, I just wanted to close, this is what I intended originally to close with this morning, was to ask you to think about two different scenarios, two different pictures. Uh, think back 2,000 years ago to... <clears throat> 
Now, you weren't there, all right? Imagine 2,000 years ago to what you know of the crucifixion story. Right? Now, it was a very busy place in Jerusalem. It was the greatest feast era of the year. There were literally millions of Jews probably in the city of Jerusalem and in the surrounding area. There was a lot of people together, united, unified in purpose. And what did they do to the Son of God? And there are people out there that you work with and your family members that uh, are similarly united in their antagonism to Jesus Christ this morning. Do you cooperate in that in any way, shape, or form? The other scenario is um, to picture uh, what should be happening on a regular basis in your life as a Christian on Sunday mornings when we gather together on the first day of the week, early in the morning, just like the first disciples did on the day Jesus Christ rose from the dead. We gather together as believers to commemorate, to remember, to think about, to meditate. We gather together in spirit, in oneness, with no organization necessarily. We're just there to spend some time with our minds and hearts united on Jesus Christ, to praise Him and to thank Him and to love Him for what He's done for us. Are you there? Do you cooperate? Are you involved? What about the life of the church? Are you a bystander? Bystander? Are you a pew sitter? Are you an observer? Or are you committed? And what we're talking about here, the subject of Christian unity and togetherness, is something that takes every one of us, right? If your body operated on the principle that you are operating on in relationship to the body of Christ in this place, uh, we'd be lying all over the floor in little pools of bits of masses of flesh and blood. Christians just aren't co cooperating. They're just not working together. One another is a concept that is too much out of mind. So this is where we're going, and I hope that you'll pray for me that I'll be able to get a new battery for my clock and uh, <laughs> be able to finish this. Let's pray. We thank you for the time we've had this morning. We just pray, Lord, that you will just instill these thoughts in our minds, help us to carry them around with us. We pray, Lord, that you will just provoke us in our spirits, in our hearts, to get into a proper relationship with you, that we might walk in the light with one another as you are in the light. We pray this in Jesus' name.